Hello, welcome to another episode of Vestibular Voices. I'm Dave Juno, the host tonight. Um, and what we have with us is Marissa, Pat, Isabel, Joy, and our special guest, Dana. And Dana is going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about vestibular therapy today. And Dana is the person who is going to teach us all about it. So Dana, welcome to our group. And we enjoy hearing what you have to say about vestibular Thanks. therapy. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yes, welcome. <laughs> welcome. So how did how did you get started by doing vestibular therapy? As That's a, a good as question. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's not a lot of physical therapists that specialize in vestibular rehab, um, but I found as I started working through my outpatient career, um, I've always had a love for working with neurology patients, and there was a huge need in my community for someone to have the skills to work with the vestibular population. Um, and so after kind of seeing a few patients in the clinic, that really sparked more of my interest and my passion for treating individuals with vestibular dysfunction. Um, and for the last 15 to 20 years, I've really focused most of my continuing education work and all of my clinical work on treating individuals with vestibular disorders. Awesome, that's amazing. That's amazing. And so what, what kind of patients do you get? Do you get a lot of people like with vestibular migraines, meniere's disease, um, MDDS? Yeah, yeah, I see really all of that. Um, you know, I see everything from um, BPPV and progress from there. So I have quite a few clients right now with Meniere's disease um, and vestibular migraine. 3PD is popping up more frequently in the clinic as well. Um, and there's been a few MDDS patients too. Um, and I'm also noticing more, and this was happening before, but post COVID, um, a lot of increased dizziness disorders and vestibular neuritis patients as well. Hmm. Dana, Dad, can I ask you a question? When I saw you the first time years ago, and it was for my balance, was that really a vestibular problem or just a balance problem? That's a good question, Pat. So the vestibular system itself is part of our balance function and our balance operation. So um, people can come to me with just a balance disorder and not necessarily a specific pathology or something going wrong in the vestibular system itself. It could just be um, that we don't practice our balance because balance is a skill. So sometimes with people that I see, it's just they don't work enough on their balance or their muscles aren't strong enough to hold them up. Whereas in other people, um, it could be a specific vestibular disorder. Okay, thanks. Sure. I have a question, Dana. How do you help patients who may be hesitant to try vestibular therapy? Um, maybe they just don't feel confident in the process or they don't think that they can handle it. What are some tips and tricks that you, you know, give them to help them through the process? Sure. Yeah, Joy. You know, vestibular therapy is really scary for most patients um, and people who are living with chronic dizziness because, you know, one of the unfortunate parts of vestibular therapy is that we have to work into that dizziness, um, which is the symptom that you're trying to avoid the most. We don't, you don't want to feel dizzy anymore. So why are we making you feel dizzy? Um, so I think it's really important to um, on that first visit when I see people is really, really educate them on what I'm looking at and why we're looking at it. And always the, the individual that I'm working with has control over the session. If they're uncomfortable, if they need a break, um, if they feel like their symptoms are becoming unmanageable, they can stop and take a break at any point in time. And so to let people know that they have control over their rehab. It's not me. I'm just guiding them through the process and using the, the individual's feedback um, to really help shape and modify their care. 
is good. Um, and I find also that the more educated somebody is about their condition and about why they're feeling the way they are and how the process of vestibular therapy works, it tends to ease some of the fear about coming to sessions. And it also helps improve their compliance with doing exercises at home because that's another big part of it. I guess, what are some exercises that, that patients could do? Yeah, so there, you know, there's the standard exercises that everybody sees all the time. The VOR exercises where you stare at your thumb and move your head and back and forth. Um, so yes, we have to start with the very basics. But then um, each patient that I see really is doing completely different exercises in the clinic. So um, it is your exercises should be tailored to your goals and what you want to accomplish in life. So if your goal is to walk on the beach, we're going to find the most unstable, movable surfaces and things to work on while you're moving your head and while you're stimulating that vestibular system, because we have to integrate the system to the activities that are important to you. So, you know, you start with the basics and then transition that into activities that are important to each person that comes through the door. I like that. I do that. I actually do that when I go like in the woods fishing. I actually will turn my head like that. And it, and it helps a lot, you know, to, to do that and help my balance even more that I'm feeling even more comfortable now going further into the woods than walking That's around the lake. But the other reason why I do it is because I'm partial. I'm deaf in one ear, partial in the other, and I can't hear that coyote coming up from behind me. So I'm always at what's behind me. But it does it does help a lot, you know, um, especially when I'm chasing my dogs in the backyard and, you know, okay, I come across that pit that they dug and, oh, instead of falling flat on my face, I'm, I'm able to catch myself a little better. Mm. You know, just because of the... because. The things, the therapy I went through after my labyrinthectomy, and again, was um, pretty similar to what you were talking about. And they asked me what I like to do, and that's what I told them. And they were like, okay, well, you know, that was one of the things they said. When you're walking, you know, walk like 10 feet and move your head this way, move your head that way, another 10 feet, and your brain will adjust. So, Absolutely. yeah, I've been doing it for a while, so, but it helps. It really does. I think that's wonderful. You know, I've had people do everything right now. I'm working with someone who is a teacher and they're trying to get back into a classroom setting. So mm -hmm. we have a room in the clinic. I'm very fortunate to have an empty space right now to work with, but I have it set up like a clinic and I have her make PowerPoints and we're turning and passing out papers. And I'm, you know, being an obnoxious student in a classroom, waving, <laughs> waving my arms around to give her visual distractions and dropping things on the floor and making her pick them up. Um, just to get that vestibular system functioning and integrating well with the environment that she really wants to get back into. Um, I've had other people where their homework is to go find a park and sit on a swing and rock back and forth or to sit in their desk chair and turn side to side, you know, so we, we tailor everything to the environments that that person is going to be encountering regularly. I can I attest to that. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Can I be the obnoxious student? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dana, I had a question. So have you had a patient or if you have a patient that, you know, has trouble riding in the car to come see you and then comes in and is just so dizzy, you know, needs to sit down first, are you kind of able to work with them right away or... Do things kind of have to calm down for them with what's going on? Um, yeah, what do you think um, with that? sure. If someone's coming in and just the ride to get to me is so triggering and so symptomatic for them, we might start out the session with some deep breathing, with working on some mindfulness, with working on grounding techniques uh, to try and calm that system down and get those vestibular symptoms under control. And then from there, we'll slow, maybe slower than normal progress into their vestibular exercises. 
And if they're not tolerating things in the clinic, you know, then it's going over what are they doing at home and what are they tolerating at home? And maybe the most important thing that we do that day is talk about their home program and modify it so that they can work in an environment that's comfortable for them. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about how important is it for your full body to have, you know, some strength training. I know one of our friends um, and, you know, one of our vestibular friends, she's not able to do the vestibular rehab therapy, but she has said what has helped her the most is just having physical therapy, you know, strengthening her legs, her core, and that has helped her with her balance. So how important does you know, other muscles play into your balance system. Sure. Um, that's a, it's an interesting point. And to do just strength training in general, you have to move and you have to move your head. So just by nature of exercising in general, you're going to get some vestibular stimulation going on and integration into, um, your function and what you're working on in terms of strength and balance. There's a couple of things, um, to talk about with that one is, you know, when you're not feeling well for a prolonged period of time, you're not moving as much and you're not participating in regular life as much. And so what happens is we see just this decline in muscle strength because of that. So it's important to, um, include strength training and include, you know, not just vestibular exercises, but a holistic approach um, and make sure that you're addressing the whole body. Um, So that is important. And the research that's coming out, especially um, focused toward vestibular migraine, and I'm sure it's going to come out with other disorders as well, is that really there is such a huge benefit to um, not only strength training, but aerobic exercise as well. So, um, you know, again, addressing the physical components, the vestibular component, but also strength and balance and stability, the whole body. um, You can't just pick one part of the body. They're all connected. So you have to work on all of them. That's so true. I remember um, when I actually had the onset of this thing, like I would kind of like not stare at the sides because that would make me dizzy. So I would just look mm-hmm. forward and that actually tighten everything and obviously you decompensate even faster. So definitely it's important to keep moving and as much as you can, you know. Yeah, we get, um, we see a lot of patients that are afraid to move their heads because that's the primary Mm -hmm. thing that will, that will oftentimes provoke symptoms. And so when you don't move your head, like you said, Isabel, yeah, the neck gets so stiff and it gets tight. And then that produces problems all by itself. It could produce additional dizziness symptoms um, just coming from the neck. It can also lead to headache, headaches on top of migraine disorders and things like that too. So it's, again, the neck is something that I work on almost with every client that comes through the door. That was one of my questions. Do you see patients who have occipital neuralgia? Is that something I do have on my right side? Um, You know, I know when I've worked with physical therapists in the past, we kind of addressed that and, you know, did some exercises for the neck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've seen that in the clinic too, Joy. So um, yes, you want to work on mobilizing the neck and trying to get as much pressure off of those nerve roots at the top of the neck where that occipital nerve is coming out um, to decrease symptoms on that. But as you loosen things up and as things are moving more, then that's when you have to start adding in stability exercises too. So working on that deep neck flexor strength and working on postural support and things like that so that hopefully Hopefully, you you don't start to compensate down the road and start to get impingement on those nerves all over again and start the cycle over. So we want to prevent that from reoccurring if we can. Does anyone else have any questions for Dana? Um, Oh, go on. Go ahead, go ahead. Is there a certain type of neurologist that maybe would specialize in vestibular or you know because I'm having an issue with finding a neurologist again so not sure which which way to go 
Yeah, there are neurologists. You have to, again, it's not the most popular thing to specialize in. Um, I think you find more neurootolaryngologists um, or ENTs that will specialize more in vestibular dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So that might be the better route sometimes um, than finding just a neurologist. But there are neurologists that will specialize in headaches or Parkinson's or whatever. So you have to do your due diligence and research to find one that has an affinity for working with individuals with vestibular dysfunction. Okay, well, that's who I believe I'm working with now. <laughs> Good. EMT, so. Okay. Yeah, and I guess uh, once you kind of sort of graduate from vestibular therapy, like how do you actually continue the, the treatment or what should you do after? Sure, that's the great question. So I never say that anyone will we'll joke and say that you graduate, but at that time we say that you have completed your plan of care. So we've gotten to the point where you know, you've met your goals and you are where we want you to be at that point in time. Um, really what should happen at that stage of your therapy is that you should have worked out a clear plan with your therapist about how often you should continue with your exercises, if you should start to taper them down and see how things go. Um, but I always try and leave the door open. Um, I'm always a contact point for someone who I've treated in the past and people that I haven't treated. Um, but I want to hear from people and how they're doing. And if they have questions that I want them to feel comfortable to reach out and ask. And it's not unheard of for people to come back if they need a little tune up, you know, different situations come up. And we have to go back and, and retrain some things and rework on some things um, so that they can be successful in new situations and encounters. Um, so tune ups and staying in contact with people are really important to do with your therapist when once you're done with that plan of care some things that patients should look for in a physical therapist? Um, you know, there's physical therapists, vestibular physical therapists. How do patients know the difference? And are there any credentials that we should be looking for? So there are certifications in vestibular rehab. Um, there are, when we graduate from physical therapy school, we are masters of everything, right? <laughs> we, we get, we dabble in a little bit of everything when we're in physical therapy school, but the vestibular system might be a week out of the entire program. So you're not really um, necessarily an expert when you come out of school. So what you want to do is find a therapist who really, really dedicates their entire caseload and their specialty to vestibular rehab. So VITA is a great resource to look for credentialed professionals. Um, I have obtained my certifications through um, the American Institute of Balance in Florida, and they list professionals as well. Um, so there are resources for that. And the therapist should have their biographies and things online, do some do some research on them, go to their LinkedIn page, go to their web, their company website and read their bios and see what they specialize in. And I have a lot of patients that come in that really just sometimes aren't sure and they want to talk to me um, and find out about my experience and how I would help them um, and how what I would, how what I do would be different from things that they've tried in the past. So it's okay to interview us too and see if it's a good fit for you. Hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? Dana? No? No, I don't think so. Well, Not at right this now. point of the meeting, Dana, I thank you for being here and answering all our questions. Um, it was a pleasure to have you on, and hopefully we can have you on more often, um, because this is awesome, amazing. So I'd like to thank everybody for watching. Um, please hit subscribe and hit the bell button so you know when we post a video. Um, I will post links to Joy and Marissa's um, Facebook page and their YouTube channels and Instagram and Dana's as well. And um, that's it. Thank you for watching and have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay.